Well, I would like to begin by painting a, a scene, if you'll indulge me. The year is 1859. The place is the city of San Francisco in the United States. But noting that it's only been uh, under the control of the United States for 11 years at this point. And one of the formerly most wealthy citizens, born British, but now living in America, of San Francisco, has just walked into a local newspaper office. He demands to see the editor, and when his demand is uh, met, hands to him an envelope which contains a document reading the following proclamation. At the preemptory request and desire of a large majority of the citizens of these United States, I, Joshua Norton, formerly of Algoa Bay, Cape of Good Hope, and now for the last nine years and ten months past of San Francisco, California, declare and proclaim myself Emperor of these United States, and, in virtue of the authority thereby in me vested, do hereby order and direct the representatives of the different states of the Union to assemble in Musical Hall of this city on the first day of February next, then and there to make such alterations in the existing laws of the Union as may ameliorate the evils under which the country is labouring, and thereby cause confidence to exist, both at home and abroad, in our stability and integrity. Signed, Norton I, Emperor of the United States. And this incredible individual is who we're discussing today in our first biographical episode of that encyclopedia podcast. What do you think of Emperor Norton? Wow. What a legendary figure. He is the only emperor of the United States that there has ever been. If you would be so kind as to call him emperor. Sounds like he really had his um, political formalities in order. Um, that letter was quite nicely written, I think. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense, you know. If there's a large majority, is that not democracy? <laughs> <laughs> I will be indulging his self proclaimed title. Um, it's interesting, actually, on a, on a meta note, that when we selected this article, um, the title of the article, even in, in, on the banner, was Joshua Abraham Norton, um, which was Emperor Norton's full legal name. But since then, the title of the article has been, the, the banner title has been edited to be Emperor Norton, um, demonstrating the respect that Wikipedians have for the one and only Emperor of the United States. Uh, and I think that's all well and proper. Um, we should note as well, of course, that four years after making this proclamation, um, following the 1963 invasion of Mexico by France under Napoleon III, he took the secondary title Protector of Mexico, but I think dropped it a few years later, claiming that uh, no one could protect such an unsettled land. This character is the kind of person who I would expect to read about in fiction <laughs> more than in real life and he's one of the few individuals who have remi who has reminded me that real life can sometimes be stranger than fiction yes he inspired fiction through uh writers like mark twain but this man was indeed real how exactly did Joshua Abraham Norton come to being Emperor of the United States? And maybe more pressingly, how did he end up with such an extensive Wikipedia page? What has he done? <laughs> where did he come from? And where did he go? And why are there no more emperors? 
Um, why don't we start at the beginning then? Um, would you like to walk our listeners through the early life of Joshua Abraham Norton? I can do that. Yes. So the uh, best estimate as to when Norton was born was in the year 1818. He was born born in England. It's thought that he was born in Kent on February the 4th, 1818. There have been some uh, like slightly off estimates about when he was born, um, and there's some stories about that in the article. The obituaries published after his death weren't particularly helpful in clarifying this birth date. And uh, the San Francisco Chronicle, which is a newspaper serving the San Francisco area, as you might guess from the title, referred to <laughs> him being aged about 65 at death. And they referred to that as the best information obtainable, uh, as it was a silver plate on his coffin. However, that statement, aged about 65, uh, apparently just came from a guess from the landlady of where uh, Norton was living that was offered to the coroner following his death. So not really the most reliable birth date. His family um, moved. They were English Jews and they moved to South Africa shortly after Norton was born. And this was a government-backed colonisation scheme, and it has its own name, its own Wikipedia page. You can read all about it if you wish. But the story is, he was born, he moved to South Africa. It appears that he moved there in early 1820, but he moved later to the United States, in around the year 1845. His journey really had taken him from South Africa back to, the, to England through Liverpool and from Liverpool to Boston. It was in late 1849 that he finally arrived in San Francisco. It's not really known what he was doing in the few years before that. But in San Francisco, well before he became emperor, he was actually quite a well-known individual. Is there anything else really that we know about his early life? There are claims that about like him arriving in San Francisco on a specific pot or with a specific amount of money or part of his father's estate, but this isn't really substantiated. But we do know that when he arrived in San Francisco, he became quite a successful commodities trader and real estate, real estate speculator, and in fact as referred to in the article as being one of the city's richest citizens. Yeah, in fact I might jump in there and just to give, uh, to, to just give people a sense of how wealthy um, Joshua Norton was by the time he arrived in San Francisco. Um, so uh, if he arrived in uh, 1849 with forty thousand dollars at the time, right? Forty thousand dollars <laughs> in 1849 currency is uh, the equivalent to, according to US Inflation Calculator dot com, <laughs> an undisclosed sum. Uh, because it only goes from 1913. So uh, let's try a different website instead. Um, <laughs> nope, that only goes from 1940. Well, okay, fine. From 90, if, if, it, if it were 1914, so the actual number will be higher than this, but $40,000 in 1914 was the equivalent of 1.1 million. And that is 70 years after the actual date. So in modern terms, this man arrived in California already a millionaire, as we would understand one, and brokered this up to $250,000 in 1850s currency. So this is 
contrary to a kind of rags to riches story, it's more of a riches to rags story, a bit of a twist. Um, and yes, would have been uh, an extremely well known figure even before his imperial decree. Um, simply due to the, the circles he would have moved in and the, the wealth that he had with him. But he, he lost it all, didn't he? he? He tried to corner the rice market and failed. Yes, he uh, put a few too many eggs in one basket, or more precisely, a few too many cents in Peruvian rice. There was a famine in China and this led to a spike in the price of rice. I'm trying to find the section, so I suppose a lot of rice was probably coming from China, and that when there was a shortage of food within China anyway, that this drove up the price of rice. Mm. And they banned exports on rice, so no rice was leaving uh, was leaving China. Yes, it couldn't be imported. Yeah, so it sounds like they were a major, potentially a major exporter of rice at the time. And so when this happened, the price of rice uh, in San Francisco uh, went up significantly. Uh, where are the numbers on that? Um... Uh, it says here that uh, the price of rice in San Francisco uh, increased from 4 to 36 cents per pound, which is 9 to 79 cents per kilo. Yes, very, very marked increase in the price there. Um, not much under a thousand percent. And so what Norton thought he would do is he bought a shipload of Peruvian rice um, because obviously he saw this massive spike in the, in the prices and so he thought, ah, an opportunity for a businessman like myself. And he came across an opportunity to purchase rice at a price that, although well above the normal, it was 12 cents per pound that he would be paying, was still much lower than the going rate uh, at the time of the famine. However, he bought this shipload of Peruvian rice at 12 cents per pound, uh, and subsequently more Peruvian ships arrived at the port, and the price dropped sharply, and he were, stood to lose a lot of money from that. Um, so he got into a protracted lawsuit that uh, didn't it get all the way to the Supreme Court. <laughs> he the was, State Supreme Court. Right, the yeah. State, yeah, the State Supreme Court. He, he um, wasn't very happy with the contract that he made to purchase the rice. Um, and I think he said that they had been a bit deceptive in... Uh, the scarcity of Peruvian rice, which obviously obviously ended up coming in uh, bigger numbers than he had anticipated. But he lost this lawsuit, and he lost uh, most of his money. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 quite. I mean, I mean, I I would say tragic, but in the sense of like it, it's tragic on a personal level, but. At the same time, this is something I might come back to as well, because it benefits from, from I think, the, the life story of uh, Joshua Norton is worthy of, of retelling, kind of objectively, um, before kind of commenting on it too much. But it definitely strikes me as this, this tale of someone who wasn't necessarily born into wealth, but certainly had established wealth, um, gambled it all in an attempt to obtain even greater riches by monopolizing uh, the rice market um, and lo lost the gamble, lost everything, um, 
and kind of almost ha- had some sort of I don't know men- mental breakdown or 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 snap or 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 crisis. Um, I think that that those questions linger in the background of a biography like this um, because although his reign as emperor of the United States is full of quite wholesome details and uh, his personal character seems to be uh, generous and kind and upstanding for the good citizens of San Francisco um, they are uh, they, they emerge from this backstory of being an extremely wealthy businessman who who tried to uh, strong arm himself into a monopoly to to attain even more wealth and it just blew up in his face i wonder who the individual responsible for tipping norton off about the peruvian rice uh was and the conspiracy theory uh, theorist in me uh thinks that you know maybe this was deliberate maybe he knew that there were actually more shipments inbound and knew norton well enough that he would gamble everything and knew this would ruin him financially if i were to write a biographical film Hmm. about his life i I would definitely cast that man as a kind of antagonist to norton who's responsible for this crash and then has to come to terms with his even greater social if not financial success due to the fallout of that decision yeah like what you said i I was interested in too is this question um well i think a lot of people if they encountered this sort of situation uh today would think oh okay this man here is uh claiming to be emperor he's probably a bit mad so there is a lingering question of the mental health of emperor norton and i think that is uh yeah, it does become a more interesting and like feasible, relevant question when seeing how he ended up in this position that he was declaring himself emperor. Because yes, it did happen after he was living a life as a successful, wealthy citizen, and he lost everything. Um, and you can imagine that having a very significant toll on him um because although like yeah his his time as emperor as we will go on to discuss seems quite wholesome in a way um i think no one would deny it it's quite an eccentric behavior (laughs) to declare yourself a de facto ruler and to go around issuing decrees that you you ought to know Congress is not going to listen to, <laughs> but he did it anyway. Um, so, yeah, I wonder what his experience of life actually was, or what he would have been like to know in in person. It's an, always mm. an interesting question that you can never get the complete answer to from a biography. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's a bit of a salvaging paragraph in the article. The very last paragraph in the early life section um, gives me a little bit of reassurance because um, I was so intrigued after I'd read the Wikipedia article that I then did some extra reading and things around the life of this strange character. Um, And a lot of the biographical summaries kind of like to portray it in this two-act structure where he loses everything and then completely drops off the grid for years before randomly reappearing uh, outside the office of this newspaper company and declaring himself emperor. The implication being that he'd had some sort of mental crisis. But this one paragraph at the end of, of his early life does demonstrate that he didn't vanish completely. He does appear uh, here and there. Um, there's evidence that after he filed for bankruptcy, he continued to run uh, as kind of smaller businesses, running newspaper adverts, selling commodities. He served on a jury and a court case. He then, interestingly, in August 1858, just over a year before he declared himself emperor, ran uh, ran for Congress unsuccessfully. 
and part of me wonders if rather than it being some sort of uh, mental crisis this was uh, just an eccentric slightly flamboyant way of getting back at being unsuccessful uh, and mm. running for Congress is like, well, if I can't join Congress, I'll declare myself emperor <laughs> and the good citizens of San Francisco will humor me um, to kind of put a more lighthearted spin on it. We may never know the truth, um, but that kind of brings us up to to the start again, where uh, no longer Joshua Norton, but now Emperor Norton the first ruler of the United States and later protector of Mexico um, has just been born on the streets of San Francisco. Um, were there any details? Oh, well, okay. Obviously there were details. There were so many. Uh, you'd be insane not to have anything stick out. So instead I'll ask you, what was the, the imperial act or the detail of his life as the emperor that stuck out to you the most? Hmm. From the decrees um, that are talked about in the article um, and some of the work he's done, it does portray him quite favourably, I think, and fairly, like, uh, morally compelled, you know. His, he's not just making a load of decrees to try and uh, directly increase his power he's basically making making a little bit of a social commentary so what was the one thing yes here it is he went to an anti-chinese demonstration in san francisco so in the eight, late 1870s there were riots that started at rallies um that were many of the, many of them were led by a man named Dennis Kearney and he led the anti-Chinese Working Men's Party of California so there was some anti-Chinese sentiment at the time and there was a rally held on uh, April the 28th 1878 and it said that Emperor Norton appeared at this rally and he appeared, stood on a small box, and challenged Kearney. Uh, and he told the assembled crowd to disperse and go home. Uh, again, this is not very much information to go on. It doesn't really tell us, like, what, what, what was his motivation for telling them to disperse and go home. But we do know that these demonstrations were somewhat racially motivated. Um, and that he was against them. Um, but aside from that, his other decrees, um, his, well, is possibly his more, more, most famous one is his attempt to abolish the United States Congress. Um, but what's interesting is that he, uh, at least attempts to justify that within the decree in which he observes fraud and corruption um, and he says that it prevents the fair and proper expression of the public voice. He says that there is open violation of laws caused by uh, factions of undue political influence. So he seems to be concerned with corruption and lobbying. <laughs> I was going to comment on that, actually. There are a lot of, a lot of these issues. I'm surprised that I've never heard of Norton before reading the article because a lot of what he declared and desired as the emperor uh, are reasonably well aligned with what I would describe as a meme culture's take on modern US politics, right? Mm. Like I could see I could see his face being turned into a meme format and it being noted that he declared the abolition of the Democratic and Republican parties on the same day um, and uh, declared them as, quote, being desirous of allaying the uh, dissensions of party strife now existing within our realm. Um, 
and that kind of accompanying it and being like, oh yeah, this man had the right idea, da 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 da. Um, not particularly sincerely or well thought through, but nevertheless, reasonably, for want of a better term, memeable, <laughs> right? <laughs> In certain circles. Um, so I'm, I'm surprised that he's not better known um uh, maybe i'm just moving in the wrong circles mm. though my favorite declaration from him is actually a more of a linguistic one um where uh he decreed whoever after due and proper warning shall be heard to utter the abominable uh, abominable word frisco which has no linguistic or other warrant shall be deemed guilty of a high misdemeanor <laughs> <laughs> and shall pay into the imperial treasury as penalty the sum of $25, which in 2022 is the equivalent of over $600. Um, pretty steep fine for an abbreviation uh, of San Francisco as Frisco, but I have been informed by friends who are from San Francisco that anyone who calls the city Frisco will be immediately decked on site. <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm glad to learn that this has been a point of some contention uh, for well over 150 years. Yes, to use um, unsavory language, you could see, say that he is a classic political shit poster. <laughs> yeah, that's that's actually perfect. Yeah, he's <laughs> he's he's, he's, a, he's a shit poster of real life fully committed ship poster precisely um yeah uh i think we should also i mean it, it's uh, it doesn't really get mentioned here at all but of course the american civil war was 1861 to 1865 so it began mm. two years after he declared himself emperor and it doesn't seem to have affected the course of his life that much when you read the article but of course it must have done um because of how severe the american civil war was um granted living on the west coast it wasn't as intense um especially you know especially given how rural the american west coast still was uh in in the 1860s as opposed to the the kind of new england and and south proper areas of the states but even still I found it surprising that the influence of the American Civil War, which happened right in the middle of his reign, um, seems to have been kind of almost completely unmentioned. Yeah, in fact, um, doing a control F of Civil War, uh, it only has one mention in the article as far as I can see. Um, and that's in reference to his, his 1862 mandate where he ordered the Roman Catholic Church and Protestant churches to publicly ordain him as emperor. And it says that he did so hoping to resolve the disputes that had resulted in the Civil War. <laughs> did, I'm questioning my sanity now. I just, do, did the influences of the Roman Catholic and Protestant churches particularly matter in the american civil war i've i i have <laughs> no idea but i suppose no. <laughs> aside from their direct influence in the civil war maybe he just wanted some extent of uh, additional uh, formality and support from religious institutions such mm. that he can you know draw upon collective piety to get some support behind his mandate. <laughs> mm. Yeah, absolutely. I the... mean, no, so I was just the, the next line I, I just, my eyes turn attention to is that, um, yeah, I, it looks like he was a, um, yeah, I, I don't know necessarily how specific his political ideas were 
but he didn't seem to be a big fan of the Democratic or Republican parties because he de he declared them abolished in 1869 as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a, a true kind of reactionary. I, I don't I don't recall bar his actual initial declaration of of himself as emperor any decrees excuse me imperial decrees um that advocated for anything i think they were all mostly advocating against things you know we'll abolish congress we'll abolish the democratic party we'll abolish the republican party um we'll abolish this and abolish that um which is quite common for um niche political positions if you want mm. to phrase it that way um it's quite easy to point out what's wrong with a system it's a lot harder to enact positive change except um, he had one major policy did he not he had a proactive policy i mean the <laughs> again this is the reason why i think the page is written by people quite favorable to him is this uh is another example this sentence here norton was occasionally a visionary and, <laughs> and some of his <laughs> and some of his imperial decrees exhibited profound foresight <laughs> he is, oh, is this is this is the bridge isn't it the bridge yeah this is the bridge so I'll just go through this whole set here. He is said to have issued instructions to form a League of Nations, to which we have one source, and then a second, a second uh, citation saying better source needed. <laughs> <laughs> um, he explicitly forbade any form of conflict between religions or their sects, um, and he issued several decrees calling for the construction of a, sus a suspension bridge or tunnel connecting Oakland and San Francisco. Um, and yeah, he, he, he seemed to become quite irritated by the lack of obedience to his suspension bridge or tunnel idea. Hence, he wrote a few decrees about it and it said that the last of them displayed his irritation. <laughs> so I there mean, you are he wants to do something he has a policy idea he does i mean it's a local policy idea but a policy idea nevertheless I, okay I, I stand uh, partially corrected um also uh, to be fair in issues of foreign diplomacy it's noted that uh beyond taking the title protector of Mexico, he also wrote multiple letters to Queen Victoria suggesting that they could marry to strengthen ties between yeah. their nations. But then <laughs> the next sentence says, this would ultimately prove futile as the Queen would never respond. <laughs> Which, uh, yeah, this article is definitely um, written in a way that isn't entirely impartial. Uh, although, interestingly, that has yet to be noticed by Wikipedians because officially the article has no issues. <laughs> um, so maybe we're wrong and we should be praising Emperor Norton more than we have been. Hmm. Yeah, uh, man, the pain of unrequited love. Uh, um, there were... There was an interesting, it reminded me of some things that were found in his room upon his death. Um, I'm trying to find the exact... Uh, yes, fake telegrams. <laughs> so, I don't know, it doesn't say here, I'd have to look into the citation, who it's supposed to have written these telegrams. But, um, so Emperor Norton seems to have died in absolute poverty. So they found a few dollars of small change upon him and they searched his uh, room at a boarding house where they found a single gold sovereign, so about $2.50, uh, some walking sticks, 
uh, an old saber that he carried around. There's some pictures of him with that. And a variety of headgear, um, some boots, <laughs> but also some fake telegrams that were supposedly from Emperor Alexander II of Russia congratulating Norton on his forthcoming marriage to Queen Victoria. Uh, and also uh, some something from the President of France predicting that such a union would be disastrous to world peace. So he, he has some fake correspondence. Did he write it himself? Has he constructed a grand narrative? Or does he have people playing the roles of other world leaders? Well, it's clearly... Uh, it, it, it's, I think it's very slanderous of you to even suggest that he would write fake telegrams himself. Clearly, he was confiscating them so that the general public would be shielded from the degeneracy of people uh, writing fake telegrams about him. <laughs> yeah, that's clearly a personal attack to write mocking letters about him being and his marriage to Queen Victoria when we know that she aired him. So... I do think uh, something that, st that did stand out to me um, is how, and again, the article is probably responsible for this, but how accepting the population of San Francisco seems to have been um, to, to Emperor Norton. I, I did some, some background reading, as I said. Um, assuming this figure is correct and and obviously it might not be. The population seems to have exploded in 1849, uh, the same year that um, uh, Norton arrived, um, going from 1,000 in 1848 to 25,000 by the end of 1849. So a 2,400% increase. Um, a large proportion of... Uh, the population of San Francisco has always been um, Asians or Asian Americans. Um, this is why the anti-Chinese riots were uh, kind of notable uh, in the area. The population, uh, the the, the proportion of the San Francisco population that were uh, that was um, uh, people of Chinese descent uh, was just below. 10% by the end of the 19th century. Um, so there were racial tensions uh, in the city, but in as much as um, Norton himself is concerned, um, everyone seems to have been uh, friendly to him, and he seems to have been friendly to uh, everyone. There's the uh, there's him standing up for uh, the uh, the Chinese immigrants, as you've mentioned before, assuming that that's an accurate recounting of the of the of the incident. But then there's also an incident where he was arrested by a private security officer, who uh, at the time kind of local businesses employed private security, and they were kind of casually referred to as policemen, and often acted as essentially policemen for their local districts, even though officially they were private security and not public police officers. Um, he was arrested by this uh, police officer and <clears throat> the actual police uh, freed him after public outcry. Everyone protested that he had done absolutely nothing wrong. Uh, the, the reason for his arrest, I should note, was um, so that he could be uh, con uh, confined to a, a mental institution due to insanity. Um, but after this was protested, he was released. And then uh, he Norton issued an imperial pardon to the man who had arrested him in the first place. So it seems very kind of relaxed, very, very friendly. Certainly, I would even go so far as to say, I would even go and say popular. Um, and Norton isn't unique at this time in San Francisco. You have the the celebrity dogs, Bummer and Lazarus, the ratter dog strays, um, the uh, befriended Norton. Um, there's also 
um, an individual called Frederick Coombs, um, a.k.a. George Washington II, who believed himself to be George Washington and left San Francisco, was, was, at, was in San Francisco at the same time as Emperor Norton, but then left um, following a dispute uh, with Norton, who he thought was jealous of his, quote, reputation with the fairer sex, after which Frederick Coombs moved to New York City. Um, and in 2022, in San Francisco, we have uh, Frank Chu, who is a conspiracy theorist. Wikipedia describes him as a professional protester who has been campaigning to impeach an array of former US presidents he considers guilty of collaborating with a nefarious network of alien populations called the Twelve Galaxies to film him against his will, to broadcast this footage intergalactically, and to embezzle the royalties he is owed as a television and movie star. So San Francisco seems to have this array of colourful personalities, and it's really endeared the city to me. <laughs> Yeah, I would love to visit San Francisco sometime. It's just very far away. Yeah. Do you think that uh, the petition, the, the, the petition to get the Bay Bridge, uh, uh, not renamed, but kind of additionally named uh, the Emperor Norton Bridge, should be, uh, should be passed by the, the city council or whoever is in charge of making that decision? I think a little plaque uh, commemorating Norton uh, would be quite a nice, uh, a nice little addition to passerby. Um, you know, a little bit, of, a little gem of culture and history of San Francisco, because he is. I mean, regardless of what he was like as a person in his life. Um, his story is interesting and somewhat charming and so I, I see it being nothing but a good thing to um, make a little bit of reference to that in San Francisco so that more people can enjoy his story and perhaps thanks to this podcast a few more people will enjoy his story now as well Thank you for listening, everyone, and we'll see you next time.